All right, San Joaquin Valley Transparency. Thank you guys for coming back to my channel. Make sure you subscribe, hit the like button, and all that good stuff. So, in my last video, I promised you guys that I would do some research regarding qualified immunity. What is it? What I learned is quite sinister and very alarming to say the least. Before we get into this, I want to mention to you guys really quick that I have a college degree in business accounting. I did study law, but that was only business law. The reason I bring this up to you right now is because from all of the courses that I took, the good grades I received, the dean's list that I made, the degree that I got from the schooling, from graduating, I realized that I had what it took to do some research, do my assignments, and to get the assignments completed. That's what I'm doing here. Sorry I've procrastinated for such a long time, guys, to bring you what I'm truly capable of doing. We're about to show you guys a clip that we'll break down. We're going to analyze. We're going to go over it with the fine tooth comb, and we're going to try to interpret it in a way that we can all understand. After the clip and after the evaluation, we'll get right into what qualified immunity is and how it doesn't work. Without further ado, let's watch this clip and get ready to get educated. We're going to be here. We're going to be here a while. So I'm going to ask you to remove your camera off of that. You're, you're free to videotape, yeah. but you're not free to impede anything. Not so impeding anything. Video. Not impeding anything. If you show me a Florida State statue that says that I can't set my camera equipment down for a second. Not on here you can. Yes, no. I can. This is my desk. All right, put it down. That's my desk. All right, put it down. So this is the moment that I believe that the deputy loses his qualified immunity. For one, he's not supposed to grab anything that's not his. Secondly, he enticed him. He told him, come on, set it down, which to me is a form of entrapment. I may be wrong, but nevertheless, that's we know what our rights are and how they, they are being constantly violated every day. But we have to understand that the judges, they're always going to make their judgment calls on how they feel about this. And when I, when I show you guys a little bit about how qualified immunity came about, you guys are going to be very angry. Keep watching the rest of the video, and we'll get into that soon. All right, put it down. That's my dad. All right, put it down. Whiskey to Acosta. No, I'm not. That's my no. I really like how Wright's Crispy, the guy recording, put it up there that he's legally snatched his camera back. When you guys hear what he tells the deputy, it just blows my mind because I have a feeling that they do know exactly what qualified immunity is. They're taught about qualified immunity, but they're not taught about well-established law. What does that mean? We'll find out. Now, now you have a civil lawsuit on your hands. You have a civil lawsuit. You don't have qualified immunity. You know that, right? You don't have qualified immunity, pal. You have a jet ski or a pension? Say goodbye. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. 11th Circuit Court. Get ready to get subpoenaed. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do not, no. Oh, okay. Well, do you know what qualified immunity is? I do not. The city is not going to pay for your mistakes today. Okay. You are. Okay. Out of your own pocket. Um, Which is actually pocket. my pocket. Short pocket. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed, abolishing segregation laws, the Jim Crow laws. And in 1967, some gentlemen were arrested who were in front of a whites-only cafe or restaurant or coffee shop or whatnot. Lieutenant Ray was called out there. The segregation laws were over, but yet they arrested these guys and they convicted them. These guys ended up winning later on. Cases were overturned, and they took it to the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court, they explained how exactly the judge and the officers were wrong in what they did, and he was looking for compensation or whatnot. And the judge, he gave them qualified immunity, and that's where we're at today. I'm going to include a, a few clips of that court case. Pay attention. We're going to get more into what we're talking about and why qualified immunity doesn't work. They arrived quietly in taxi cabs. There were two police waiting on the back ramp of the bus station. The police went around the back way and met the priests as they walked through the main entrance of the bus station, past a police stanchion right in front of the entrance to the bus station, which said, white only by order of the police. As they went into the door of the bus station, Father Jones, one of the petitioners here, uh, heard one of the officers say, shall we get them now or shall we wait till later? In any event, 
the, 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 there were 15 priests in this group, four of whom are petitioners here, walked through the entrance and started toward the coffee shop a few feet inside the bus station. A few of them, of the 15, did actually get into the coffee shop, but at that point, one of the two police officers, either Officer Nichols or Officer Griffith, Griffiths, two of the respondents here, uh, halted them and made them come, those that come in the bus station come back, and they halted the whole group and, they, and were told to move on. At this point, one of the priests said, uh, we are on our way to, to Chattanooga, we have tickets, and we wanted to it'd be a long trip, we wanted to have uh, coffee or sandwich or something. What's going on in this court case actually reminds me of the black man that was arrested for eating a sandwich on the BART station. Does, am I the only one? Anyways, keep paying attention, guys. This is really important. Before we uh, take off on our trip, no com the police officer said, move on. With no moving on, they were arrested. And, and not being told, and the re record doesn't reflect why they were being arrested at that point, or what they were being arrested for, or why they were told to move on. But in any event, a few moments later, the respondent, Ray, the deputy chief of police of Jackson, Mississippi, and at that time the captain of the police, came in the station and immediately walked up to these people and told them to move on. Not seeking information from the other police officers, they were already under arrest. In any event, uh, the comedy went on and he told them to move on. They repeated the same thing. They wanted to uh, have the sandwich before they took off for Chattanooga. And he, at that point, not, not moving on, he also arrested them, and they were then taken off in the traditional Jackson paddy wagon to uh, the jail, and where they stayed two days later when the case was then tried before Magistrate uh, Spencer, who convicted them and sentenced them to the maximum sentence of four months in jail for the offense that they committed, as well as a fine which was put upon them. Uh, all the petitioners here remained in jail for at least seven, and Father Jones, I think, something like 17 or 18 days, the reason being that bail was coming from various communities to help bail them out, and it took at least seven days to get bail, and, and more for Father Jones. In any event, after they all were released, they went on to the convention, they appealed the case. And the, in Mississippi, the first uh, appellate procedure is this de novo trial. And at the de novo trial of Father Jones, the first one tried, after the, after the prosecution's case was in, motion was made to dismiss, and the judge presiding at that uh, level dismissed the case on the grounds there was no showing of a violation of the statute. It was there, and all the other cases were accordingly null prost. At that point, uh, shortly thereafter, the complaint uh, was served in the case before us and was tried, as I said, before Judge Mize. The defendant's verdict, we appeal to the Fifth Circuit, as indicated. Now, the first issue that I would like to spend some time on is the one which, in which the Fifth Circuit dismissed the action against the uh, convicting magistrate, Spencer, one of the respondents herein. Now, it is our position that this was an error for many, for many reasons, and I would like to go into that in some way. The statute, of course, 1983, the opening words are every person. So that on its face, anyone who <laughs> violates 1983, whoever, whatever his position in life may be, is liable. The question then is, are there any limitations in this broad language which should uh, be a, a guide to any court considering the matter. Prior to the well-known case decided by this court in 1951 of Tenney against Branhoff, there had only been one case interpreting this point, to the best of our knowledge, and that was a case entitled Picking Against the Pennsylvania Railroad, a Third Circuit case, which held in the manner that we are requesting this court to hold. That is, uh, there was not an immunity for a judge who violated the statute. However, Tenney against Grandhoff set off a whole new line of cases, which are referred to uh, both in the opinion of the court below and are referred to in my worthy opponent's brief. And in fact, I think this court has either accepted or is considering certiorari in two related cases, 
involving a Dombrowski case and a Bowers against Heisel case on related questions. Every, every circuit deciding the case since Tenney has decided in a manner uh, in which we consider in error in interpreting the statute. Now, Tenney involved... To, as to uh, judicial immunity. Uh, ju as judicial immunity, yes, Your Honor. You're yes. referring now only to this uh, I'm only referring judicial to defense. I, I am not concerned with any other questions, Your Honor. Yeah. Now, Tenney involved, of course, a state legislator, legislator of the state of California, and who was sued under 1983 by someone claiming that he, Tenney had violated his rights. Now, under Tenney, the majority decision was based upon what was considered to be the ancient immunity of, of legislators. Uh, and there is no other basis for that decision as set forth in the decision. Oddly enough, there were, this, of course, the reason is irrelevant, because if the 1871 Congress wanted to specifically include state legislators, the fact that there may have been an ancient history exempting legislators would be of no consequence whatsoever. However, the, the majority decision in, in Tenney is decided solely on the basis of the ancient history of immunity to state legislators. Now, there were at least two other ways in which that case could have been decided in the same, coming to the same conclusion, which would have, however, been more accurately a reflection of the law, that the judge, so far as the judge is concerned, convicted and deprived the petitioners of rights, privileges, immunity, etc., for the sole purpose of enforcing the segregation laws, customs, policies, and usages of the state of Mississippi. You contend that that's corrupt? I would contend that that is a, what is considered to be a violation, what we consider to be a violation of the statute, deliberately imprisoning someone with, without any evidence in the record, and it's that is not fact supported by that quotation, is it, that you just read? I'm sorry, sir. It's not supported by the quotation that you just read. Your position is not supported by the quotation that you I just would not, read. I would not accept that, Your Honor. Uh, That's what I'd like to know. Just well, I would say that... Square your position with that. Let me get back to my quotation. <clears throat> we, what Senator Trumbull has said here... First of all, of course, if he acted innocently, the judge would not be punished. And we don't dispute We accept that, of course. And Your that is problem is what is innocent. What is innocent. And but we also say if he acts corruptly or viciously. Now, I am not, an ex I don't, viciously is not a word of art. It's common parlance. But I would certainly think that that would apply to a judge who, without evidence, convicted and incarcerated people knowing there was no evidence, and this is based upon not only what I say about the case and what the complaint says about the case, but the fact that on the first appellate level, the judge who tried the case dis dismissed on the prosecution's evidence because he said there was no evidence to show a violation of the statute. And we say the record reflects, though that is not important from the purposes of position we're taking here in this case, that they were convicted because that sign outside the bus station said that anyone who entered that bus station who was Negro uh, was in violation of the law because that sign said white only by order of the police. And I, it's hard to conceive of what that means except in terms of uh, anyone other than a white person who enters or who whites and Negroes who enter together are in violation. And that's why they're arrested because the testimony of the police here says these these uh, petitioners did absolutely no act which could be remotely considered wrong. And unlike the Adderley case, these people had a right to be here. Sound familiar, anyone? So this type of thing is actually still happening today. People are getting arrested for things that are not even illegal, and they're getting convicted. But in the eyes of the law, it says that it's okay if an officer arrests you for something that you didn't do, as long as he did it in good faith. That's what qualified immunity means. How does that work? Leave some comments. Let me know what you think. Keep watching. This is important. There was no question they have a right to be in a, private, in, a, in a bus station quietly and peacefully with tickets in their hands about to go off to Chattanooga. I mean, whatever, the, the, whatever the merits, 
of an Adelie type of situation, they don't apply here at all because these people had a public right to be there. And they were asked to leave, not for anything they did, but because that sign outside the, the door of the a, a station did not permit them to enter the station. And he had jurisdiction. The judge had jurisdiction, did he not? It, yes, there's no question that he was, he was, they were charged under a Mississippi statute, disorderly conduct statute. So that, in that sense, he, they, he had jurisdiction, of course. There's no question about it. But uh, we, uh, we think that the intent of the Congress of 1871, from reading the, the, the Congressional Globe at that time, is so carefully drawn against the sham justice that was per 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 uh, perpetrated in the period from 1866 through the period of 1871, that the very kind of conduct that is concerned in this case is the kind of conduct the 1871 Congress was concerned about. They were concerned about the phony justice, the sham justice, the, the, the police who arrest and the judges who convict when there is no evidence of any, any, any wrongdoing. If you're still here, that means you're here to learn. I truly appreciate you. Thank you guys so much. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, go ahead and do so now. Share this video with everybody you know. It's important that this message gets out. This is my first part to my qualified immunity series. I'm going to try to educate myself and learn more about this and why it doesn't work. And does it work? I don't know. I don't think so. It doesn't seem like it. The case should be outraging everyone. This, there's more, there's a lot more to it. We're going to cover it all. I'm going to get into it. Thank you guys for tuning in. Watch the rest of this, these clips. The original video is an hour long. I'm going to put the link in the description so you guys can go watch it. Here are some important parts of that video that I cut out for you guys. Watch the rest of this. Be ready for part two. Stay tuned. Subscribe. Share this video with everyone. Somebody please reach out to Colin Kaepernick and all these guys that are out there doing something. Let them know what I'm doing. I think this is important. I think if they jumped on board, I think they could make a difference. We need your guys' big voices out there. Don't just say that there's a problem and not offer a solution. Thank you, guys. I'll see you guys soon. Part two. Watch the rest of this. The, the distinction that we draw, and we think that, the, that Senator Trumbull draws that distinction perhaps better than we can, but we just think the distinction is that when a judge does it knowingly to perpetuate an illegal custom such as segregation, then he would be liable. But if he makes a mere error of judgment or is unacquainted with the law, that would not be any violation of 1983. We're not questioning his right to continue to make errors of judgment. We, can t we do question the right to sit, for example, to take a, a, a case which I think <clears throat> might lay out the situation. We do question the right of a judge to meet with hoodlums the night before he knows he's going to cake, have a try a case and, and tell the hoodlums, okay, fellas, I'm going to give the, throw, the, throw the book at these guys tomorrow morning when I try them. That's the kind of case we're talking about. And the, and the decision of the Fifth Circuit and of the other circuits, if upheld, do not permit 1983 to cover a judge under those circumstances. Now, just briefly, every case that has come since Tenney against Brando, even though Tenney was a state legislator case, every case that has been decided by the circuit courts, and there have been several uh, since then, have decided solely on the basis of Tenney. Even though Tenney refers to a state legislator, those cases which refer to judges are given the decision uh, in the same manner as, as, as if they have the application to the Tenney, Tenney doctrine. So Tenney has, in a sense, if you permit me to say so, led the courts astray by an improper analysis of the, of the, of the statutes of 1871-1866. It is, uh, it is our position that if Tenney had been decided on the basis of the legislative history and the analysis of the words of the statute, the other courts would not have made the mistake. As a matter of fact, Judge Magruder of the First Circuit in, in Francis against uh, Kraft, which has been referred to by the court below and by our worthy opponents, is a typical case where Judge Magruder in that decision says the statute is very broad. And I am very grateful that the Supreme Court has decided Tenney against Brandhoff because, in effect, it takes me off the hook. And that, this is precisely what, uh, what Judge, uh, Judge Magruder, who is a very fine judge, has said in a, in, in a case involving a judge in Massachusetts. Reflected by your complaint, as I read it, your complaint does not even allege any motive. Well, it does to this extent. I'm sorry, I'm too interrupt. It does not relate, uh, allege any motive on the part of the judge. Well, it says that 
These people were uh, convicted uh, in violation of their civil rights for the sole purpose of enforcing segregation laws. You don't have any allegation in here about corruption or corrupt motives or vicious purpose or anything of the sort. Well, I Is that right? think, I'm sorry, sir. I would think that when, when some, if a judge convicts somebody for the sole purpose of enforcing a segregation law or custom, that's the spelled out the violation. You allege here that, they, that a state judge convicted a person for the sole purpose of enforcing the segregation laws, customs, policies, and usages of, of the state of Mississippi. That's right. And usually state judges <coughs> are kind of supposed to do that unless there's a supervening uh, federal uh, law. Well, they, 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 they were convicted under the color of a state law, that is, the disorderly conduct statute of the state, but not because there was any evidence showing a violation of the state statute, but solely for the purpose of, of convicting and incarcerating these people because the state intended to uphold the segregation, that is, the judge intended to uphold the segregation laws of the state. I had the violence in Alabama just two months before that just a month before this occurred, there had been freedom riders in, the, in Jackson, and they had uh, caused almost violence at that time. These, the coming of these, well, this Mr. group... Ms. Grayson, just let me pursue this other question yes, just sir. a moment. Let's assume a judge uh, says, well, I agree. I agree that uh, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, has decided a case in a certain way, uh, and that that case applies to this case, but I think the Supreme Court is wrong, and I'm not going to follow the Supreme Court. Oh, well, no, sir. I would say there was no liability whatsoever. That's a matter of judgment and a matter of his interpretation of the law. So that is that was not uh, that is what you're saying. No, is, sir. So, so he could, he might deliberately decide to deprive a man of of the of constitutional rights, but that wouldn't make him liable. No, sir. Not unless he was doing it corruptly. The illustration that Mr. Rockland used would be perfect when he got together the night before and conspired with one side and said, I'm going to deliberately decide for you and throw the book at him. Now, that might be corrupt, but not a judge differing with the Supreme Court of the United States well, or any other judge, court, is, yeah, I think, is corrupt. What if, the, what if the judge says, well, I know the... Uh, the, uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964 uh, requires equal uh, equal service and public accommodation. Yes. No, and, I would say not. And I know that the owner of that uh, uh, the public accommodations refused uh, refu refused service. And the judge says, "But I just don't agree with that statute, and I'm not." Gonna... No, sir. I would say that uh, that was his his honest conviction of what the law was. Well, no, he says, I know what the law is, I just won't follow it. Well... Here's the statute, I know that... that, that uh, You're getting a little, little deep, if, <laughs> please, I, that's a rather serious question that has not presented here whatsoever. This uh, statute not only has never been held unconstitutional yet, under which they acted, under which they were arrested, but uh, the Supreme Court of Mississippi, two years after Judge Spencer's decision, affirmed similar cases and made exactly the same decision. So you couldn't possibly say here that uh, there was any, I know what the law is. The law was valid on his face under which they were arrested. These policemen, uh, these um, uh, practitioners in their garb, in their church garb, mixed group, broadcast the fact and planned deliberately to come down to Jackson, Mississippi and to be arrested so they could be what they call witnesses of incarceration and go to Detroit as be witnesses they came to be arrested. They broadcast it over television, newspapers, of what they were going to do. They came down in a grove to the, drove to the, in taxis to the bus station and went in. Now they, the opposing counsel has not given you the testimony on the other side. They went in and 30, there is testimony that 30 to 40 people followed them in, that they had angry expressions, that they were muttering, and that they followed them into the bus station. These, uh, this group of churchmen turned in to the left and started towards the restaurant, and the police, two just beat policemen on the street, told them to move on. They turned back, 
and instead of moving, blocked the stairway in the bus station, stood in this narrow hall, and uh, something the jury didn't need to be told was that that bus station is a very small room, and proceeded to recite the Lord's Prayer. There was a crowd, not only had 30 or 40 followed them in, but they had, uh, uh, there was a crowd in the station. There was muttering, mumbling, wrongful, uh, 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 violent gestures until all three, Mr. Ray and the other two policemen, testified emphatically that they thought that violence was about to ensue and that it would ensue if they did not arrest them. Now, this is not a criminal case on which the criminal convictions would, uh, would be involved, which would be decided on different principles of law and different basis of proof, where you'd have to prove guilt of such a, a crime or breach of the peace beyond reasonable doubt. This is a case where the only proof necessary is those, did those simple policemen standing there on that day with that going on, believing and assuming their own testimony to be true for the matter of this argument, have probable cause to believe that violence was going to ensue. Uh, Mr. Grayson, where, <clears throat> where will we find in the record uh, their statement that they <clears throat> were coming to Jackson for the purpose of being arrested? Uh, Your Honor, please, I have to find it. Uh, in my brief, I refer to uh, they are a long group of directives or letters which were written to the whole group before they came. And for judges that come along, or those that No, sir, I, I would think that any immunity would uh, uh, you're leading a, You're leading a little bit on the side of the dissent in the Terry Penny case, then. In the what? <laughs> I didn't understand you, Mr. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking about my dissent in the Penny case. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're leaving that way. <laughs> uh, but I do say that all the question of corruptness is beside the issue. In this case, we don't have to go that far. We don't have to go whether there be any corrupt, actual corruptness, because there was not. There wasn't any evidence of anything except the judge giving his his best judgment. Which I'd like to get to the immunity of the police officers, because if there's anyone that I feel here stand here that I would that needs representation and that I would like to do my best to represent, it is the policeman on the beat in these troubled times. When he doesn't know what to do, he has to make snap decisions. He has to, he has no lawyer running along his side to tell him what the law is or what the facts are, or whether he's right. He can't remember afterwards. Take all this crud in this past summer, the thousands of arrests where policemen have arrested people where they have thought at the time that they were justified. Suppose one of those men, three years later, says, well, I was acquitted. The policeman doesn't remember him. He hasn't gotten out and gotten witnesses and getting names, getting ready for a lawsuit three or four years from now. He doesn't know uh, what the fine points of the law. He's got to use his best judgment in whether or not there's violence about to occur. And that is the, what we submit. That is the common law immunity of, of police officers. It just goes as far back as the immunity of, ju of, of judges. If they have a reasonable grounds to believe that uh, there's probable cause of, of violence, then under the common law breach of the peace, they have a right to uh, um, to make an arrest without a warrant. In other words, probable cause is a complete defense to a police officer for a suit for damages at common law. There's no change under 1983. Is there a suit for false arrest or? False arrest, yes. Or, yes. Well, that would be true under Monroe versus Pate, too, wouldn't it? Uh, certainly, Monroe and Liberty versus Pate does not say that. It doesn't say to the contrary. It has nothing to do with this case because that was a search and seizure case. And under a search and seizure case, uh, there is no defense of probable cause. They searched the man's house, not in good faith, and also searched it uh, uh, without, a warrant. without a warrant. And uh, for a false imprisonment case, probable cause of the, on the part of the police officer is a complete defense. In an illegal search without a prior arrest, 
probable cause is no defense whatsoever. Uh, when that case was remanded, it was only before this court on a, uh, because the complaint had been dismissed as not stating a cause of action. And the court, this court merely said that it stated a cause of action and uh, uh, remanded it, which I don't think any complaint could have uh, came any nearer stating a cause of action than that one, or any more completely stated a cause of action than that one did. This cause remanded it to urge the court to give this case serious consideration because of its importance in the future litigation of the thousands of cases in the federal court and on the effect it will have on our police force all over the country if they are subject to suit and subject to money damages with little pay and families, and if they are subject to, fund, uh, to, to suits for damages, it can have a disastrous effect on the protection of the public. Mr. Jason, may I ask this last question? Yes, sir. Are you asking us to reconsider Monroe and Pay? Oh, no, sir. I say it, I, my position is it has nothing to do with this case whatsoever. Well, the Court of Appeals relied heavily on Monroe and Pay. Yes, Pace. sir, and I think they thoroughly misunderstood it. It was a, a, a search and seizure case where probable cause had no, was no defense whatsoever. Well, as I, as I read their opinion, they rely on Monroe and Pate saying that uh, good faith uh, is irrelevant. Yes. Uh, if, in they, fact, uh, they said the color of a state statute which they thought was valid. Uh, they, they said they, it's inherent in Monroe versus Pate that uh, they, uh, the good faith under a state statute talking about actions under 1983 only, yes, yes. Uh, was immaterial. Uh, Monroe versus Pate didn't even deal with acting under a state statute in good faith, believing it was to be valid. They, they were acting without any, uh, well, contrary then, to well, the state Well, then your answer to me is uh, you don't want us to reconsider it, just to no, say that the Fifth Circuit misapplied. Misapplied it. It, had, it didn't have anything to do with acting under a state statute, which was later declared unconstitutional. They were acting without statute, beyond, contrary to the state statute. And by definition, the uh, search and seizure in Monroe against Pate could only be illegal if there was no probable cause, and there was therefore a finding when damages were found that there was no probable yes. cause, and that took that defense away, isn't that the point? Yes. Would you mind? Yes, it took it away. Excuse me. Yes, Mr. President. Would you mind telling me in the Senate just what is the question the state presents in its petition for such a vote? Well, the state is not here. Well, it's I the, you mean I'm the sorry. petition? The one error of the court below in saying uh, that the probable cause is not a defense to false imprisonment under 1983. They said it was a defense under common law. Yes, yeah. in other words, uh, if this is to go back to who's file against the officer, as I read the Court of Appeals, the only factual issue is going to be consent or invitation. Yes. And you suggest that uh, there has to be an addition or perhaps but they have the reversal and affirmance of the district court verdict on the ground that the issue of probable cause that, that, that will be a defense in the case and properly submitted to the jury. Yes, I, I would be submitted to a new jury if there is to be a new on, trial. On a new trial. Well, there, even under your uh, position, there has to be a new trial because there are errors of evidence. Well, I, we in our brief we have said that we thought the Fifth Circuit differed on. Uh, error erred in saying that those were errors in the evidence, but um, I have not had time to argue. See, they okay. were just small matters of evidence. When I started doing these videos, I understood that there was a problem in government. I understood that there was a problem in policing. Why is there such a disconnect between citizens and law enforcement? The propaganda, we see it on TV. Um, whenever there's a situation, you see police without shame pretty much beg for more policing, more um, more leniency, more immunity, and we've basically given it to them. Shame on the news networks, shame on the propaganda that they spew on us, um, shame on all the garbage that they've presented to us so that we can truly believe that officers are heroes. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a cop, but not in the sense where I wanted to go violate people's rights. I wanted to stop crime. I wanted to do things like that. And I just went a different road. And I'm glad I did because I don't want to be one of those people who have a su 
superiority complex, the God complex where I feel empowered over people. If you don't listen to me, I will arrest you, beat you up, whatnot. There's a reason why there's a disconnect between the people and government. We need to understand it more. We're not taught in school about laws. We're not taught anywhere about the system and government and how it works. Obviously, police are not taught on government and how it works either. They just make their best judgment in good faith, and that gives them qualified immunity. Well, basically anybody could do wrong and say, you know what, man, I did it in good faith. Sure, I did this crime over here, but I needed to feed my family. It was in good faith or whatever reason, you know, like it needed to be done for the betterment of, you know, my family, myself. I don't know. Like I said, this is all new to me. I'm sure it's new to a lot of you guys. There's a lot of people out there that are, you know, famous people that are taking knees and not um, playing or not saluting the flag. And, you know, there's a lot of disconnect. There's Black Lives Matter. There's a bunch of groups out there. Um, but I don't see anyone really offering a solution. I knew that when I was starting to make these videos that I was going to do my best to offer solution. One of the things that I'm bringing to the table is getting rid of qualified immunity. Um, police are not going to like it. But in reality, I feel that we can actually change that mindset in the law enforcement community. I think that police, you guys, if you're a police officer and you're listening and watching this video, um, you guys should understand that you too should be held accountable. Imagine me sitting here saying to you guys, just because I created this channel for now on, everything that I do, I should not be held accountable because I'm doing everything in good faith. That that doesn't work, man. I just I will probably turn into a bad person. And that's probably what's happened to a lot of you guys. I've spoken to a retired police officer um, for many, many hours. And what I got from him, and he admitted basically um, what the uniform and the badge and the gun did to him. Um, it turns you into somebody that's not you personally. Um, you you stand beside yourself. You're not the person that your parents created anymore. You're not the good son that your mom wanted. You're not that son that your father was raising to become a hardworking man. Or were your parents police officers and all they care about is propaganda and do what you can to survive and come home that night. It doesn't matter if you make a mistake as long as you did it in good faith. No. America, everyone in America needs to be held to a higher standard. And we need to be held accountable for our mistakes. Me too. And you too. All of you. Everyone. Every single one of us. We should be held accountable for our mistakes. We don't want to confess to them. But yeah. And if you're a police officer, like I said, start thinking about this. How can we fix this world how can we make it a better place people are people in every area whether you're a doctor whether you're a mechanic it doesn't matter you're a fisherman and you're a police officer there's good and bad in everything but if we pretty much think and behave as if a police officer gets a badge and a gun and a uniform that he can do no wrong then that's giving that person the god complex and that person will turn into somebody that's not themselves and that's the disconnect between the people I hope I'm educating some of you guys um, educate yourselves as I'm trying to do let's figure out this thing of qualified immunity and absolute immunity and this ancient immunity that our government public officials have I personally don't think it's working um, but I'm going to continue to do more research on this and present to you guys my findings Thank you guys for tuning in. Be prepared for part two. This is only the beginning of what I'm trying to learn and educate on qualified immunity. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful day and speak to someone. Share my videos. Share my channel. Subscribe. And you guys all re go reach out to these guys, man. Um, all these famous people that are out there doing things. Um, I would say Kaepernick. I would say... Um, a lot of people that are out there doing this. Somebody talked to Danny Trejo. There's there's people that are out there that are famous 
and the, that want to be involved in in how to make this country a better place. I'm seeing a lot of these guys on Instagram. I'm seeing a lot of these people on on TV, but what I don't see is a solution. I say on my channel a lot of times that if everyone recorded police on the course of their duties, then the practice of racism couldn't exist in the police force. And even officers have heard me say that, and they say, wow, that's good. So, like I said, man, let's keep this thing going. This is part one. Be ready for part two. Stay tuned. Thank you.